The following lesson is a presentation of PrepLogic's Learn Smart video training. To find out how you can get unlimited access to our entire Learn Smart video training library, call 1-800-418-6789. I don't know if you've ever been to a large city or not, but if you have, you've probably experienced highway congestion. Now, it's interesting because just about anywhere you go in the world, people think their highways are the busiest and most congested highways that exist anywhere. And of course, that's our own personal experience. And it can be similar on networks. That is to say that our networks use a shared medium. Multiple computers are communicating on that network at the same time, or at least taking turns communicating on that network. And what this does is it causes congestion, and sometimes the appearance of poor performance. So one of the things that we have to deal with when setting up an Ethernet network is this shared networking concept. How do we make sure that each PC gets a fair amount of time on the network? How do we make sure that our mission-critical applications get their fair share of time on the network? These are questions we must be able to answer. So we have to talk about some of these shared networking components now. We've got several issues that we're going to have to deal with regardless of what size of network we put in place. Number one is the Ethernet segment length. We have to identify what the maximum segment length is for every technology that we're going to use. Whether it is standard unshielded twisted pair, a fiber optic cable, or some sort of copper base technology that we use to make our connection like 1000 base CX, which has a limitation of 25 meters. We've got to know what our segment length is. We have to understand that the longer the cable gets, the more the degradation of the signal will be, and the harder it's going to be for us to adhere to the CSMA CD access method. Now, we may choose to use a repeater like a hub or a switch to extend the overall cable distance. Keep in mind that if we put a hub right in the middle of the two network stations, each station with 100 meters of length with unshielded twisted pair, it's going to extend that cable length to 200 meters. So it will repeat that signal and provide for us a cleaner signal all the way through, and of course, much greater distance. But we have to follow the 543 rule of Ethernet. And that 543 rule says that we can never have more than five segments with four repeaters and three segments populated. So it's very important that the 543 rule is followed when we implement any type of Ethernet internet network. Since most of our technology has been designed with the aim that we can scale our networks to any size without worrying too much about the segment cable length, we need to focus more on the things that are very important, like the collision domains and broadcast domains. These are the things that Cisco really focuses on here. Our main goal with all of our network designs is to limit the size of the collision domain and to limit the size of the broadcast domain. Assume we have a hub that has 50 people on it, and we have 50 PCs that are connected to it. Every single time a person on this network sends some data, all of the other 49 systems will have to examine it, and they will all have to compete for the segment bandwidth. In effect, they will all have to compete for the same segment for transmitting data. It's the same collision domain. Now if we take a switch instead, which can micro-segment a network, we're going to be able to reduce the size of our collision domain down to a single port. And I'm going to show you how this works in just a minute as we're going to get into the layer two switching. I'll provide a solution for reducing the size of the collision domain. There is a solution for reducing the size of the broadcast domain. That is, how far a broadcast can go. What is its effect? You have to remember that Ethernet is a broadcast-based network. It uses contention. If we send a data packet, Everybody on that wire that's within our collision domain has got to examine the packet. If we have broken up our collision domains, then the only thing that can pass throughout the collision domain is the broadcast, because that should go to everybody. Everybody within our broadcast domain has got to examine that packet, which adds to network overhead and wastes bandwidth. It can waste CPU cycles on the target machines if that data packet is not actually destined for them. So we want to be aware of collision domains and broadcast domains, and how we can provide solutions for these. The other big thing that we have to deal with is network congestion overall. Networking congestion can be a result of collision domain size, broadcast domain size, the number of hosts on the network, the segment length, 
and the number of repeaters. What is network congestion? What causes it? Well, one of the biggest things that causes network congestion is just simply having too many hosts on a segment. It is one of the most catastrophic things you can possibly do, like putting 500 people on the same wire. So we've got to compete from a collision standpoint. Of course, we're going to have reduced bandwidth capabilities because we've got so many systems sharing the same media. Now, every protocol is going to have different limitations. So if we're using TCP IP, it has different limitations than other protocols such as IPX or Apple Talk or any of these Layer 3 protocols. They have a different effect. A physical limit of less than 0.1% of the total number of output packets is going to result in a collision. So in other words, less than 0.1% of the total packets that are sent on any given wire could collide, no more. If it was 0.12, we've got too many collisions on that wire. We have got to have a different solution. This means we've got too many hosts on that segment or we require another look at a different technology. The other major problem that we have with networking congestion is just simply broadcast and multicast based traffic. We've got an acceptable level of broadcast based traffic of less than 20% of my total segment bandwidth. If my total segment bandwidth is 100 megabit, it means that we can never have more than 20 megabit of the total segment bandwidth ever at one time being consumed by broadcasts. Now you would be surprised by the applications that are out there today. How many applications are broadcast based? How many operating systems actually still send a tremendous number of broadcasts out on the wire? And you know what? Every host, far and wide, in between layer three domains has got to examine those packets. And that could be a real problem. We start to get into routing. We deal with routing protocol updates, which can be of the broadcast or multicast variety. Some routing protocols, such as distance vector, will actually send updates as often as 30 seconds out of every interface for possibly a network that hasn't changed in two years and has actually remained stable. I still have updates happening every 30 seconds. So it's something that I have to contend with. Different network services like IP services, the DHCP protocol, which is used for automatically retrieving the IP address for a new client, DNS and WINS, will also eat up my segment bandwidth and cause networking congestion. It's important to look at the various segmentation solutions. If our problem is too much broadcast or multicast traffic, then our general solution is to segment the network and reduce the broadcast domain. We do so by adding routing technology which we're going to look at in greater detail later on in the series. We may also choose to use VLANs or virtual local area networks to create separate broadcast domains. We can also limit the amount of broadcasts that we have by limiting the number of hosts that we have on a single segment. We have to keep in mind that it's directly relative. The more hosts on the segment, the more broadcasts we're going to have on that segment. If our problem is media contention, what do we do? We've got to reduce the collision domain. The best way to reduce the collision domain is to use a layer two switch or a LAN switch. Another possibility is to use a bridge or what's known as a transparent bridge. We can also choose to limit the number of hosts on a segment. The overall goal is to reduce the collision domain or reduce the number of computers that are communicating on that same collision domain. One of the earliest options for segmentation at the collision domain level was to use a transparent bridge, which is a software component that operates at layer two of the OSI model. Now, in fact, what a bridge can do is very similar to what a switch does. In fact, switches evolved from bridges. But the idea was that the bridge would obtain MAC addresses from one of multiple ports that the bridge itself had. It would identify the MAC addresses on either side and would never forward any unicast based traffic to the other side of the bridge unless the destination MAC address itself was destined for the other side of the bridge. So basically the purpose of the bridge was to forward, filter, or flood frames. The problem with the bridges was they had very few ports and they were very slow. Then along came layer two switching or LAN switching, which can help reduce the collision domain in more or less the same way as switches. However, LAN switching does provide a complete solution to media contention and a solution to duplexing. However, LAN switching also forwards or floods broadcast and multicasts to all ports, but it uses MAC addresses to make forwarding decisions and does so on a port by port basis. So every system that plugs into a port is automatically going to have its MAC address known on that port and it will